And um, go back and answer a question that I don't think we answered, which is how do the actors think about all this? Well, at first they were a little bit like, uh, especially with the stuff that we were just throwing right on the floor. Um, and and some of the actors also, I think, were, were kind of new to the whole film world. Some of them had come, done a lot more stage work. Um, but it was really interesting. Some of the other actresses and actors who'd been around for a while, when I would come in last minute and do stuff and 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 and, and you know, be doing little tweaks, I knew that they knew what I was doing. And so they, even if the AD was sort of running their mouth, she like a couple of them would just sort of like start to razzle dazzle, like have a conversation with the AD to distract them, to give us the time to do what they knew that we needed to do. I heard a lot, I mean, hair and makeup, uh would always come to the monitor and tell us that they've never seen their uh, their actors or actresses look this way before. So what we were doing, I, I mean, I'm assuming was high level um, for them. And, you know, uh, they started calling it fine art. Um, and, you know, me and Teddy would just smile and just be grateful. Uh, but it, it was fun. I mean, it literally was fun. Like, I, I really, like, I mean, and, you know, we dealt with, you know, older actresses and, they were still excited about the way they looked and, you know, um, just working as a professional, you know, that's something that, you know, generally comes up. Do you know how to light someone who's been on screen before? Um, do you know how to light, uh, you know, these actresses who are, you know, big names and have a certain aesthetic that they want to maintain. So it's like, with that system and still kind of creating, uh, still having that expectation, uh, it's, it's and, and pushing against a mandate of not having any lights, right? So you couldn't, I mean, occasionally we could, but you couldn't bring in a light last minute as a source because that was, we, you know, I mean, sometimes you couldn't because literally where you wanted to be was the camera, the other camera was looking right over it. So then it was, you know, like that's where using the panels and having having all this ambient come in from below, it would allow us if I could get the right angle or also you know, one stand up, right? Just the, the very base of a C stand slipped in between two things um, would help us and, and we could get those moments. And again, you know, still talking about physics, it's like, you know, you start to learn these reflective surfaces, you know, the skin types, the skin tones, this, you know, the reflections of that each character has. So, you know, I think number threes were something that we use a lot, like, you know, but there was also a lot of times where we would use ones and zeros, right? Like, because some people could just manage it. And you don't start the softness at the face, you start the softness way before it even touches the face. Um, so, you know, thinking about what reflective surface we start with um, to create these, um, you know, more aesthetically pleasing sources, you know, for these women actresses, you know, the older actresses and and, you know, it's just kind of starting to think about how you utilize the tools that you have. And lighting is, you know, even though it's, you know, instruments that we light with, it's the surfaces that we play with, you know, how you break it up, you know, what's what you're doing to kind of create these realistic feelings. This day only proves why we study light. Like this building, this concave building, lit the entire scene and as the sun moved so did the scene move it, it was insane and i was like teddy thank you for putting this building here <laughs> and we literally embraced it like it was no joke like we shot the scene that lit the scene like it, the actors were in like beautiful pools of light like and then the sun would go away diegetically and come back and it was just like i mean you can't it's something about how you use these things that naturally happen and embrace them intuitively, put them in part of your process. There's a there's a world beyond that, right? It's like, for me, it always was, I could not stand that people understand the importance of light. So for me, I, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a light bridge reflector or mylar, it's, it's understanding what it does and understanding the room that makes it so amazing. And then having people stand in there and feel that light and say, this feels so different. It's like, I don't know. It's like, it's like the wheel, right? Cause the wheel seems like really basic and then it's not right. Like all the physics that, that applies to it and all this stuff and all the different ways that you can use a wheel. And, and that's sort of the way it is. It's like, it's super deceptive. But like I tell people, I'm like, Oh, so it's just a reflector. I'm like, yeah, that's not, no. And, 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 and you know what, if, if not everyone understands it, 
that's okay because at the end of the day, you know, when you just use it and then they're going, how do you do that? Until you drive in a car with three of them in the front and then you start to see how light moves like. Oh, that was the best. And, and he drove practically. And so he drove and all we did was just have three different kinds right at the front of the car. And no matter where they turned, it would change, but it would fill. And like, is it again, is it always perfect? No. But like, so you're getting a little bit of, di you know, that dissonance that like you lean forward, is it? And then, and then it gets better again. You know what I mean? And then it, the resolution. So, and, and, it, and, um, and the way it resolves on a skin or face, it's just, it, it, you can't replicate that. Like, you can make a chase, but like something about it's still going to look artificial. Like, it's just that natural roll off. It's like, you know, as the sun changes, it takes on whatever color is being emitted. Like, so you see greens when they're in trees, like the reflection of color. That's where that's where being metallic is the huge difference is because it does transfer the color too, um, and that is such a big deal, like um, um, of, of the whole world. You know what I mean? And, and it's reflecting. It's sending all of that. and at a time when everyone's trying to figure out how to get everyone back in a movie theater, we as people who grew up going to movie theaters know there's a huge difference. Like you can have as big a video wall as you want. It's not, it does not feel the same. It doesn't hit the back of your brain the same as sitting and watching a reflected movie screen. Cause there is a different wavelength of light that hits your brain differently when it's bouncing as opposed to being a diode that is right directly at you. It's also because the thing always is, is we're so used to lighting at something. And so, especially when you're talking about skin tones, right? We're lighting at an actor's face. And suddenly when you make that transition to understand we're lighting with it, like suddenly the clothes they're wearing, you know, the wall they're standing next to, it all falls into place. And that's where for a lot of people, it's sometimes hard to you know, understand that it's not like, yeah, you push a light into the ceiling, you got more fill it, but it looks horrible because from the top, it doesn't work like that. Everything has to be in balance. And it took me a long time to figure out, like you always hear the inverse for a lot. Further lights away, the more natural it looks. And everybody's measuring how much light fall off you have in the, your singular light source. But in reality, that matters much less than when that light that's far away starts to touch the surface and how it starts to ping around in that room on hands up. And suddenly the stuff comes into play when you're adding stuff to the floor or into the face. There's all, you know, it's like you're saying, it's like music, everything falls into place. But the way you have, <laughs> that you have to send me a music piece, please. So, well, I mean, I, I'd say quickly Holst and, and or uh, Aaron Copeland are big, two big ones to do. But um, I think there's something about having lighting sources that when you're you know like we're so used to just like this is a key and then we're going to take down and it's just a little bit of the fill and there's backlight right um and 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 when you think of it in those terms I, after working with the light bridge a lot you start feeling like that's a really 2d way of going about stuff because like you know when we put the lights so like i'm i'm, I'm in my my you know my apartment building house and um what I have is that the sun is hitting the outside windows and then it's hitting shears. It's also bouncing off of the floor. So I've got a little bit of fill from the two windows. I've got it off of the floor. I've got a light up here, right? I've got this computer screen. Um, you know, I've got a door. I've got, you know, a bathroom door over here. And I've spent this whole time, the strike period, I've started sketching every day. And so um, I went from not really doing it to like, you know, I'm, you know I sketch every day. And I, now, now I've got like a giant toolbox of all these different, you know, uh, charcoals and pencils and graphite. And, you know, you can't, you can't stop a, a tool nerd from being a tool nerd, no matter what. Like every new thing you do, you be, you know. Um, but it does make me look at like now I'm much more attuned to like all the all the roundness of people's faces and all or the, where they're angular and how light coming from different places. And when you're sketching, I'm thinking, OK, well, where's the shadow? Where's the light coming from? And like where's so it all becomes this sort of um, understanding of all of that. You know what I mean? But there's something about the light bridge. Like you said, you know how you showed it, like what you have right there, what you're working with now, which is a, a, a three with, what is it? A two inside of it? It's a three and a two inside, exactly. Right, right, right. So, so you've got this multifaceted thing going on, right? Where it's not just one dimensional 
Here's a book light, right? And it, even if, you, okay, we did a book light and then we got a topper and a bottom or all we're ever doing in that is occluding the light, right? And now we're going into this, like Caravaggio, just trying to take it off of the walls. Um, so I guess the one really interesting thing is, 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 is like when we went to video, it became a big thing of like, oh, we got to take any light that we don't want in someone's face off. And it was going to take all the light off of the wall and take the light off of this. By moving all of the lights sort of outside, I almost never had to do big cuts anymore. You know what I mean? And 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 then it became, how do I add some more light on the wall? And using Lightbridge, it became really easy how to do that. Like I said, it, it's a way to carve people out in 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 spaces that's not just their face. And, and, and they become more three-dimensional because it's not just this light and they're falling off in the back, right? They're moving around and as they move around, you know, we, we get a real sense of their whole body, their shape of who they are, because we are def we're helping define the world around them. And, and the interesting thing is the actors started finding these puddles of light, these pools of light, because I, it's something innate in us that we just gravitate to light sources or, you know, windows or whatever, whatever the, it is intuitively, we just gravitate to something that, you know, is lit, right? You know, we don't sit in the dark corner unless you want to, right? Like, and those are all the choices psychologically that we start to create. Um, and that's what started happening. You know, we started, you know, creating these worlds and they just literally lived in the spaces, which was interesting. Um, you know, six months of just watching that was enough case study for me to be like, yeah, um, this creates a whole nother feeling of, of, of image making. Well, it, it, you know, what I was just thinking about was so in um, Anna's garage where so she was a piano tuner. And, and so we had this garage and that was a crazy set because we would sometimes shoot during the day and that we do night work. Right. And so I, I had to tent out like literally at one point they told me we, we're going to start with an exterior He's going to walk in and we're going to see him walk halfway down the building. And then, well, then we're going to walk with him in. So I had to tent out enough that you could see the building. And then as, as a night, right. As an exterior. Um, and so part of that was rigging in a couple of the panels inside the tent so that we just had a little bit of hot light that felt like some other street light was coming across, but you know, from the throw, right. Because otherwise it wouldn't work. You know, otherwise it wouldn't have that spread or have anything to feel like something across the street because it was so close. Um, and then in the daytime, we had all this stuff like quickly have to move all that out of the way. And and both the lights that we're doing, but also pianos are really interesting because there's so many reflective surfaces with them, not just the, the lacquer, but sort of all these like golden, um, you know, the uh, harp that's inside of it and, and you know, and all the brass pedals and we had she had stuff all over her shop because they were all in parts right so all this material was all over the place um and that was really interesting to find a way because sometimes i think one time we even did it where anna was stepping into something and i we bounced it off of we took a soft source and bounced it off of the lacquer of the of piano to give that reflection just so it helped her in her light so it was like putting in a three that was only in reflection, but just so once you hit that one, that resolution moment, when she hits that one moment, when, when you want it to see them differently, like that's, a, that, for me, that's a really interesting way of, of thinking about it was finding those moments when. And it never had marks. So it was, you know, it, it was no way to kind of re replicate any of it. So it was just. I, like, yeah, and you couldn't be like, you need to hit this. Like that yeah. was not a comment. <laughs> there was never any marks. So it was like them finding it was always kind of intuitive for them. Like, and, that's what we kept trying to create was this like intuitive feeling of, of naturalism, um, you know, and, and not even the drive it in like a snooty way, but it's like, you know, it's, it's just consistently thinking about what this light source is, right? The reason why nights, you know, a, a, a blacked out tent can look like a street uh, is because we're constantly thinking about what is this light source? How is it, how does it emit light? Uh, you know, what is it? Is it a hard source? How far is it? How high is it? How steep is it? What street is it? Like, you know, in the beginning, you know, we, I mean, we were doing a movie about a TV show about a plane, you know, we had flight simulations, we had like flight plans, we had, you know, I took a flight per weekend, just to kind of start to see how light moved in an airplane. Um, and I didn't even know what the crash was until I was flying to Savannah. And we had two missed landings. 
And I was like, oh, that's it. And I called Teddy, I called David Boyd. I'm like, we found it, this is it. Um, and it, But it, it's interesting because it's like, without that thought, right? To go so close to nature, um, you, you lose so much of it, right? It feels lit or whatever people say when they see something that, does, that looks artificial. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's the game that we kept playing and challenging ourselves with, which is, you know, why, you know, it's like you go to work and you feel like you're, you know, like Teddy said, it's like, you feel like you're a part of it, like, um, because it's so rich in your routine. Would you mind talking about how you reimagined the scene of the crash of the airplane? It was so fascinating. You're telling me about that setup. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's it, for us. It was about how do we make this real? Um, and secondary, it was like you know, it was uh, we need really bright light sources, um, you know, because you, we don't want to have anything inside the plane that you know creates this you know smaller space of. Uh, because the plane was an entire chassis it was the whole 160 you know, the whole cabin you know i mean it was the, yeah all 160 seat uh seats so you could see down the whole aisle so we had to have a consistency throughout it what we were struggling with is not just oh and we're just going to do a crash for the pilot there was a significant amount of of story told before the crash of of meeting all of these characters whose lives affect this is all the preamble to the whole show so we had to understand who these other characters were because we knew that they, their lives were impacting the characters that we had were meeting, you know, and, and later. And so we had to be able to tell all that stuff and then switch over to a, a crash pretty quickly. And, and that some of it was having pretty long arrays and we had what, it was uh, 40 feet of lights that could drop at 20 feet per second. And then we had a whole series of, you know, because we didn't have, a CRLS that was as big as we wanted to be. What we did do is is we had beadboard all along the floor of the whole run, and we had beadboard on truss on motor, so I could tilt them. I could I could tilt the whole thing. I could roll it um, on both sides. That secondary source definitely sells sky. Definitely sells lightning. It, it's something about the double reflection that we learned or that we fell in love with, and everyone was like, "What." What what makes this feel real? Right. And so and so what that was was the lightning strike lighting up the plane and reflecting off of the beadboard the, the the shiny side of the beadboard and back into the thing. So there was a microsecond of 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 a secondary slightly lower um, spark that felt like lightning off in a cloud far away, like because because it was softer because it was a reflection of a reflection and um but still had a slight hard because of the shiny side of it um and the way that it was timing out with the big strikes it was like this like you know duh, 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 you know um it's three-dimensional as you say i mean and that's the thing is and, and that was that was a bob ross that was a full-on bob ross that was not you know we we planned it it's not we didn't hang those thinking oh and this will do that and that's what it's there for it was more so that we could we could, you know, depending on the time of day, be able to bring in a harder source from you know 18Ks on the ground hitting the beadboard and shining it back into the I always forget like when when people's this happy accident. Well, it was an accident, but in reality, it was your accident. And the genius part about it is to see it and to actually say, stop, we like this. And this is this is what separates, you know, teams apart. See how that Guys, I'd like to, this is amazing. We could talk for hours here. I, I do want to say one thing, right? I mean, it's obvious you guys are a deep dream come true. The level of thought and stuff you bring onto the onto your shows is incredible. Um, but there's one thing I think that is very significantly different than from a lot of people that I've met along this route of lighting is there is such a cutting edge to what your thought process and what you do is. And I was just trying to understand how did you get to a space in your life privately to be so open and so free to come up with new ideas, to accept things. Let's look at this paintings. So let's look at this. Oh, I'll do painting now. I'll do this here. Because that takes so much out of a human being to push yourselves to something new. 
I was just trying to understand where did he get to those beautiful human beings he are? What took that to not say, I'm done with life. It's, you know, I'll go to the crafty. No, for me personally, it was windows were hard for me. Um, like, you know, it, like I always, something about windows always looked artificial. Um, and I, and I think I wanted personally, how I got here is, is I always tasked myself to make a window look real. Um, and, you know, that's the thing, you know, we shoot on stage all the time. We always use trans lights, you know, there's formulas, people could tell you how to do it. They'll always, you know, go through the rhetoric. This is, this is the light. This is the process. This is the, the density. This is the side that the kind of focus that you need on the trans light to get there. But to me, it was always like, how do I make it look real? Um, and I think with that process in my mind, it, it 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 kind of just started to generate something different because but why wasn't it enough for you sorry to interrupt you why isn't wasn't it enough for you to accept other people's way of doing trans lights and using lights what pushed you to something else personally uh boredom right like you know not being creative enough not having uh, uh because you know it's the routine of it right like you i can come to work every single day turn those lights on you know go to q22 go to q101 all right and we just sit in the queue i mean we could do that every day but i think the more interesting thing is <clears throat> you know how do you create these worlds how do you create these scenes and how do you help tell the story right like how do you um you know allow yourself to you know to be interested again like you know we're here for six months like 10 months like you know, we might have a two month or a month hiatus and then we're back at it, like, um, to be realistic, right? Um, so it's like, how do you create that excitement um, at work? Um, how do you create, you know, that energy? And, you know, my team, my, my, you know, the electric team that I work with, we've been working together, you know, since 2016. And, you know, we just create our systems. We all have our things. I'm sure Teddy's been working with his team for longer. They, I mean, they pretty much grew up together. His guys, like, you know, the one of the things I love about the business is that you constantly meet new people. Um, you know, we don't like if I wanted a job where I do the same thing every day, I, there are plenty of jobs that I could go do that. Right. Um, I could go work in an office and, and, and do modifying versions of that. But I didn't want that. So automatically you're in an idea. You're, you're in a mindset of I'm going to be it's a new challenge every day. And that's we're going to embrace that challenge. And then along the way you meet all these people and the people that really you're drawn to are, you know, I had one of my old boss, Bob Andres was, was a, a sort of like really mad. I mean, not mad genius. He was, I mean, he was so creative in the way that he approached stuff, really using um, materials in different ways. Um, and, you know, he worked with Wes Anderson and Spike Lee and, and, and Noah Baumbach. And so he sort of had a niche and he, I saw that you could be this sort of like, there was a version of a, um, a key grip that, that existed in that, where people saw how much they were adding and creating and, and, and bringing to the table. Um, and then, you know, and then I, I met another director, a friend of mine who started out as a dolly grip. And he always said that, you know, how does it serve the story is the one question he's always asking everything is how does it serve the story? And so when you approach something from that level of like, we're all here to create something. And, and my job is to try to use the tools that I have and the part of the project that I'm supposed to be in charge of. And what can I do that will best help serve the story? And, but when you work with, people that allow you to bring it every day and, 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 and you're allowed to sort of not just that, but then foster it of, they come in and they say, thank you for the work you're doing. And, 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 you know, the writers are coming and talking to you. I think part of it was that Tim and, and Justin, and I always looked like we were having so much fun that people started coming up and wanting to talk to us, you know, I mean, and that, that became part of it, you know what I mean? And where, where once you're allowed to have that attitude and have enjoy being at work, then everything sort of follows from there, right? And that's what, you know, ideally that's what we all try to do. And, and and I try to, you know, I understand that some of my people aren't gonna want to approach or think about the work anywhere near what I'm trying to think about it is. So that, but I try to keep mindful of that, that they're not getting that return on it. 
So I have to figure out how I can make their day fun too, in, in whatever way it is, because they're not going to, they're not going to benefit from the currency that I'm benefiting from. You try to really foster a great group of people and and that they know that they're there for each other. So, yeah, I mean, it's a family, it's a culture, all the above. I mean, you know, kind of sticking back to the original conversation is, I don't know, I mean, to help somebody find that, I mean, conversations, I think the most interesting thing uh, is like when you start listening to some of the great cinematographers, they always have some kind of interesting system, right? Like it, not just to be exclusive to one or two names, like, you know, they all have something that really makes them interesting. Um, you know, Harris Avedis is another guy who was always talking about services. You know, Darius Kanji talks about how the camera moves and what he does to kind of create energy. So it's like thinking about all that, like everyone is adding an element to tell the story, right? Like, you know, Brad is always talking about how what is this light source come from? Like, even though, you know, we're in this nebulous space, right? Like, so it's like challenging your mind to kind of think about, you know, all of these spaces as something, right? Like, even if it's a balloon light, like, what is that balloon light? You know, is it, is it a, a hanging light lamp? Um, is it, you know, is it the sun? Is it, you know, is it a fluorescent tube? Like, because a balloon light is an area of light, but if you treat it as, you know, a light fixture that we all know, then your mind just intuitively says, oh, that's that. Um, and you start to create these worlds in that way. What, what I was thinking also is, is, you know, and maybe it's just who we are, but having spent a lot of time trying to be as naturalistic as possible, I would love to go and do a sci-fi movie with this stuff. Or like do something that's like really where you could be hyper realistic or like really be off the wall and find out how to use the tools, knowing what they are, how to then, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time bouncing color, right? What would happen if we start bouncing color? What happens, you know what I mean? And, and mixing bouncing of color. Um, so part of it is, is just like, do you have an, I guess, you know, do you have an inquisitive mind? And And if you do, you know, and that's whether someone like you, who's, who's, I mean, as a grip, you're always trying to solve a problem. Um, you know, and that's, that's, I have a joke with, with my friend when, when uh, my business partner, he said to me once, like someone was complaining about, oh, you got to fix that problem, fix that problem. And he was my best boy. And he shouted out, the minute you get tired of solving other people's problems, you got to stop being a grip. Um, Cause that's the definition of our job, right? You guys are insane. I I we ha I am gonna cut the ropes now. We pretty could do on for hours, and I really really hope we can do so soon and do something together, because meeting the two of you really it's it's been such a joy. I can't put into words really. Yeah. So guys, thanks so much for this. It was a huge pleasure. Have a great day. So good to see you guys. Well, talk right. soon. Yes. Absolutely. Be safe. Okay. Bye.